Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Parallel C++. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about dynamic partitioning. So in our last video, we looked more in depth at static partitioning, and we looked at a few different ways that we could implement this uh, static workload distribution. So we looked at one coarse grain way and one fine grain way. Now, regardless of which kind of strategy we choose in static partitioning, it's always going to be susceptible to some corner cases where you know we wind up with a workload imbalance. So where some threads are say overloaded with work and other threads um, say are sitting idle, right? Or don't have enough work. Now, the reason for this is because um, our static distribution or partitioning strategies have no way to adapt to our incoming data. We're kind of locked into, you know, how we're dividing our work between our threads, right? And this, you know, you know, kind of method or way that we're doing this distribution might be suboptimal. So one of the ways that we can, you know, you know get around this problem or, or fix this problem is by adopting a more dynamic strategy. So instead of deciding ahead of time how we're going to divide up our work, we'll wait and see how the data looks, right? And maybe let threads uh, get work, right? As soon as they're able to receive more work. So we're gonna be looking at, um, you know, one of the ways that we can implement this kind of dynamic partitioning today using Atomics. And we're gonna compare it against our fine grain static uh, partitioning scheme from last time. So let's go ahead and open up um, to start off with our static scheme from last time, just as a bit of refresher. So here I've got our implementation from last time. So as a reminder, our work that we're going to be doing is just sleeping a thread for some number of microseconds here. And that's going to be according to um, these integers coming from these four different uh, uniform int distribution bins here. So we're going to have two to the 18 total work items here. And all I've really changed from our example last time to now is I've changed the order in which we place elements from these bins into our work items vector. So instead of having all of our elements from bin one at the beginning of the vector, followed by the elements from bin two, then bin three, then bin four, what I've done instead is created kind of a worst case scenario for our static distribution here. So now I'm kind of, uh, you know, striping these elements right inside of our vector where we push back two elements from bin one, followed by two elements from bin two, then bin three, then bin four. And what we've essentially done is made sure that um, threads six and seven, so our final two threads, always get the longest running jobs. And things like bin uh, threads zero and one always get the shortest running jobs. So the elements coming from uh, bin one that are only between one and 25 microseconds. So we've created kind of a worst case scenario here, but this is entirely possible, right? Um, in, in the real world, this data could be streaming in in some sort of pattern, right? Um, that, you know, we don't know ahead of time. Now getting down here to our actual work, right? And our spawning of our threads is the exact same as last time. So we just spawn each of our threads. It's going to run this uh, work lambda here. And each of our threads is going to iterate over this work items vector according to this stride of num threads, which is eight in this case. We're just fixing our parallelism to eight. So thread zero will get elements 0, 8, 16, 24, 32, so on and so forth. Thread one will get elements 1, 9, 17, 25, and so on and so forth. Um, right, and the same goes for threads three and thread four, right? So we're just round robin giving, you know, these individual elements to each of our threads and then repeating. Okay, so that's our static distribution scheme from last time. So how might we adjust to this, right, with a dynamic scheme? So let's go ahead and open up this uh, one dynamic.cpp. Now, everything, you know, at the top of this file, right, our setup for a problem is I exactly identical here. So we're still creating, you know, two to the 18 total work items based on these four different bins. And even the way that we put these elements inside of our uh, vector is exactly the same. So we're now put, you know, pushing these elements back into our vector um, kind of two at a time. So two from bin one, then two, then three, then four. Now what we're doing instead of, you know, statically dividing up our work is we're going to do it more dynamically. And that's going to be done using this atomic int here. So we're going to use this atomic integer to keep track of the next work item. And what we're going to have our threads do is request or get a new work item kind of at will. So whenever they're ready to um, get a new work item, they're going to do an atomic fetch and add on this index here. And that's shown in this work loop, right? So we just have a simple for loop that's going to be run by each of our threads. So each of our threads is going to do this uh, atomic fetch and add 
on our index to try to grab a new work item. So if we're going to get the current index and atomically increment, right, this index, right, to update the value, then we're going to check to make sure that, you know, it, we're, we're still, you know, in the number of work items we have. So, you know, I, whatever we fetched is less than that two to the 18 number, right, our total number of work items. And then each iteration of the loop, we're just going to try and, you know, get another work item by doing another atomic fetch and add here. In each iteration, we're just going to sleep for some number of microseconds based on whatever index we fetched. So instead of knowing ahead of time, say, which indices are going to be mapped to each thread, each thread is just going to grab another work item whenever it's ready to, right? Whenever it wakes up, goes through this for loop again, it's going to do this atomic fetch and add, right, to get another index to process, right? So uh, this means that short running jobs can, you know, quickly wake up and grab another work item and long running jobs will just, you know, stay processing their work items. So, you know, we never have this situation where, you know, a thread gets through all of its assigned work items and is just sitting idle. Our threads are always able to grab another work item as long as we still have work items left. Okay. So here at the very bottom, right, we have our actual spawning of our threads. It looks exactly the same as last time. So we're just in placing back um, this lambda into our vector of stood J threads here. So those will all join in the destructor of the J threads. Okay, so let's compare the performance of these two cases here. So we can go ahead and start by compiling um, our static case, right? So the static scheme of uh, partitioning that we looked at last time, but with kind of a worst case workload mapping and then we can go ahead and do the exact same thing for our dynamic uh, uh, partitioning scheme, right? Using that std atomic. And we're going to be using the exact same compilation flags for both of them, right? O3 optimization level, linking against libp thread, and using the C20 standard. So let's go ahead and compare the performance between these two strategies, right? So we'll go ahead and time our, our static example, right? So this is a our fine-grained uh, static partitioning case, but where data is coming in in a, in a suboptimal way, right, that leads to this kind of worst case scenario. So here we see, you know, we're all the way back up to taking, you know, four and a half seconds or so um, to process our entire vector of elements in parallel, right? So, you know, not that great. So let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, dynamic partitioning scheme using that std atomic, right? So here, our threads are just able to grab another work item, right, whenever they uh, become free. And we see a performance is a whole heck of a lot better, right? We're all the way down to around 3.2, 3.23 um, seconds total here. So by allowing our threads to keep grabbing new work items whenever they finish, instead of, you know, just statically assigning our work and hoping for the best, we're able to get a large performance improvement here, um, at least in this case. So we're going to be looking at one final example here, right? This uh, two dynamic.cpp. And the example is almost entirely identical, except we're going to be using the exact same, uh, uh, you know, distribution of work inside of our work items vector as we saw in the last video, right? So instead of doing that striped pattern um, all of our, with all of our work items, we're going to have all of our elements from bin one at the front, then all of our elements from bin two following that then followed by bin three and bin four. And we're going to be using this, you know, th this case with this std atomic here. So let's go ahead and see how this performs on this other um, distribution scheme, right, of our input data, right, or our jobs. So we'll go ahead and compile to dynamic.cpp uh, with again, the exact same flags here. And what do we end up seeing? Well, what we end up seeing is that, uh, uh, our, our, our implementation here with our dynamic partitioning scheme is fairly robust. So we have a completely new distribution of our input data, but our performance is still pretty good. We're still getting around that, you know, 3.2, 3.26 or 7 seconds um, you know, total to process these 2 to the 18 items, right? Um, with two completely different distributions of our input data, right? Or at least orderings of our input data, right? So it's a bit more of a robust solution than our static partitioning scheme, right? Um, our static partitioning scheme, we can have good cases and bad cases, but with our, uh, our more dynamic scheme, it's able to kind of adapt and threads are able to grab work whenever they're free. Okay, so that's a little bit on this dynamic partitioning, comparing it to our static partitioning scheme from last time. 
So static partitioning is always kind of susceptible to these corner cases that lead to kind of these worst case outcomes. But with dynamic partitioning schemes, they can be a bit more robust. Now, this isn't to say that dynamic partitioning is always the correct answer, right? Um, there are certainly situations where we don't want to have to pay this cost of, you know, the cache line misses that we're going to get um, with this index bouncing around between our cores. There are times when we can uh, perfectly well just statically map our work and not have to pay that extra cost of maintaining this global index. So there are cases for using static partitioning right where it makes sense. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'll link below the video this uh, reference page for Stood Atomic that we used in this video. And of course, you can find this or any of my other examples at github.com slash coffee before arch. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.